Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And do you want to say something first? Yes, I do. Yes, yes okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming today. And we, we do know that a lot of you have to rush off for the uh, the open house for postgraduates. So I told Conrad, don't be upset if everyone leaves like <laughs> earlier. Uh, it's not, so, but so we're very happy to have Conrad here. I first met Conrad uh, a couple, couple months ago at the, B, the BBC. We are both being interviewed on the World Service together. And his, uh, his topic was so fascinating. I said, you must come to Sydney. And, and talk about your work. Um, he's going to talk about a very interesting topic, um, which is called on memorial on memorialism. I mean, <laughs> on mem memorialness, digital and human memories. Um, I think it's going to be a great talk. So Conrad has is, is, is done many things. He's a he's a writer. He's been a writer. He's a designer, photographer, web editor, teacher, and media producer. And also um, he has focused on information and knowledge management, which is related to some of the life and science people here. Uh, Conrad actually did some work at the City University designing these, that. these <laughs> systems years ago, believe it or not. Okay, so without further ado, can we warmly welcome uh, Conrad to City University. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not, I've been got this room for an hour and a half. I'm not going to talk for an hour and a half. I'm going to throw some things some ideas out, and for those of you who are able to stay, uh, it would be great to use that to spark off some discussion. So I chose this topic of uh, memoriousness, um, which is a sort of made up word, but it relates to uh, a short story by Jorge Luis Borges uh, called Funes the Memorial, um, which I want to touch on at a certain point within uh, in the presentation. So I um, switch up, switch into the laptop. Um, Adrian said, "Will you send me the PowerPoint slides?" He doesn't know me well enough yet. I loathe PowerPoint, and I tend not to put text on slides. Text is perfectly capable of shooting out of my mouth in great quantities, and uh, I prefer to give you something to look at. Um, sometimes I won't have a picture that actually is relevant at all, in which case I'll just put up a nice picture <laughs> that happens to play a, a memory role for me and make, make a comment about that and I'll go on. And I also want to demonstrate some things uh, which a little bit in video, uh, a little bit in actively working in metadata in a uh, in image management or, um, piece of software, and, and also some audio. So I've got the sound plugged in as well, although I haven't tested it, so we'll see how it goes. Please, can I'm, I'm going to be here for a second. Okay, so um, uh, I uh, never finished my university um, studies. Uh, I was at Glasgow University, and for a while I was studying history of science. Um, so since I dropped out, I've had to try to be an unqualified success. Um, one of the things that I enjoyed about uh, the history of science was we read this book, Francis Yates's book on the art of memory, um, which is it's not terribly new. It's been around for quite a long time. You might want to look it out. Um, and she relates how from ancient Greece onwards, and particularly with a burst of interest in the Renaissance, uh, there, were, there was an interest in cultivating the ability to remember things. Cicero, for example, used images, rather it, absurd images or tableau, which he imagined, in various niches around a villa to remember the salient points in a legal case so that he could, uh, you know, he didn't have to kind of look at his wax tablets and look clumsy that way. He could orate. So, uh, uh, so I'm quite interested in the, way, in the relationship between images in particular and memory, um, but I don't believe that images are a memory, but they are kind of memory artifacts. That's the term I shall I should use. Um, I just want to tell a story uh, that I heard. It amused me greatly. I can't remember it was on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> For all I 
talk about memory, I forget things. Uh, but uh, it was a, a pub quiz night, and there were three or four older people who formed up one team. And as they were asked the questions, they were setting down the answers, they were conferring and they put down the answers. The table next door were young people who hit Google as soon as the question came up in order to find the answer off the internet. And actually it was the older group who won. And the younger people were completely mystified that people might be able to contain that much knowledge in their heads. <laughs> it kind of boggled them somewhat. I, I find that it's quite interesting. Perhaps there's less importance that's placed now on remembering. Perhaps we outsource, um, certainly I think we outsource more and more of our memories to machines, and I don't resent that. For example, when I'm trying to figure out what the conversation was on the email list, Kidden, that I organized around a particular topic four or five years ago, the email search may well tell me um, and people say, gosh, Conrad, what an amazing memory you've got. And I say, no, I keep all my emails, don't I? Um, so, there we go. Uh, let's go on. Uh, if you want to contact me, by the way, that's my uh, email address. And uh, I have a website called Conradiator, which is frankly a bit of a mess, but it's where I kind of put stuff. The download section has got a number of documents, including some of the ones I shall refer to. Um, now, one of the things about this, I was very amused, was it two days ago, there was a piece of news that the Oxford English Dictionary has added to uh, several new words, as they always do each year. Um, and, one, and this is a selfie, and the word selfie uh, joined the pantheon of allowed words in the Oxford English Dictionary. And that's a pretty good one for Scrabble, I reckon. Um, so I shall say nothing about twerking, which also uh, hit the dictionary this week. Um, uh, and here, but this is not a selfie. This is the photograph that Adrian took when we were at the BBC. Uh, we didn't try interviewing this chap. We couldn't get him up the stairs. Um, so. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, and Bill Thompson, who was interviewing, actually, he's exaggerating. Uh, he was the one being interviewed about the mobile phone thing the, with the smells uh, from, for the mixed reality research here. I was involved just in a bit of extras that are tagged on the end for the podcast. Um, now, that, I'm going to remember that. That photograph, 10 years' time, if I'm still on the planet and not being abducted by Daleks or die. Probably more like it. Um, you know, that will remind me of, of the, that particular day. So, a lot of memories hang on things like that. Memories hang on all sorts of things. Memories hang on my Seabolt Seminars shirt when I was working for Seabolt Report on Publishing Systems in San Francisco, who were on the shows. You know, it's quite a nice thing to keep. I dig up all sorts of things uh, all the time. So, for example, this is a little. Um, booklet that I, uh, that I produced of Songs for Life um, from Thailand. I don't know if any of you read Thai, but that was, that's my handwriting in Thai. It's quite wow. nice to find that I've still got things like that. See, I like playing with the toys that I invented. Um, now, I actually, uh, by nature, I call myself a, a documentalist. And I've always been quite interested in science and technology from an early age. And that's partly, you know, Doctor Who is partly to blame. I was certainly very keen on uh, XL5, Fireball XL5, Stingray, and uh, Thunderbirds. And in fact, my brother Kevin and I built most of the Thunderbirds fleet in the good old Blue Peter fashion. With, when, that was, those were the days when a young child could go out and get some really serious glue because we didn't know there were other things to do with glue other than stick things together. <laughs> you know, we had sheath knives and all sorts of things that would freak people out these days. Um, so I, 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 that's not one of my, my photographs, so I just threw them up here. But I kind of progress onto that in documentalization. I don't think that's in the English language, in the dictionary. Explaining things, for example. I do a lot of explaining. I do quite a lot of technical documentation. So for instance, this on a Macintosh is shortcuts to get some of these characters 
Um, and, uh, and, and also that's carried through into producing video and producing audio resources. So for example, this is the splash screen for a DVD um, that I produced for the Institute of Ismaili Studies, where I had to absorb quite a lot of information about the early history of Islam, admittedly from a Shia point of view rather than Sunni, and, uh, and then present that in a series of, um, and it, I've got this on the hard disk, by the way, the video, if you just want to see it a little bit, a bit later. <laughs> but there's the kind of thing that I've been involved in. Also, writing, so I'm not expecting you to write that, but it's sort of there, read that. But for example, we were doing a kind of a cross-section in time, quarter the end of the year, 956. It would be really nice to jump in the TARDIS and go back and see uh, the Caliph, Abdul Rahman, uh, and uh, the court, and meet Hastai Ben Shakur, and all of that stuff. So, I uh, was kind of explaining all of that in sequences, and if on another document uh, for a younger audience, even the evolution of camel saddles was dealt with by me. Um, so, I'm, and I've become increasingly interested in history um, as time's gone on. Um, now, actually, in let's see, it's for about in two in less than two hours' time, a young friend of mine, Beatrice. Also, um, uh, is going to be teaching a, uh, a course on tree, that's the Akan language, Ghanaian language, and, and culture. And one of the reasons I'm slightly underprepared for this talk is because I've been working like crazy to get her training materials together, um, sort of with about 20 pages of history and culture in there. So. And having to absorb them, that sort of thing. But one of the things that I've observed while doing that is that Ghana has a very interesting. I mean, Francis Yates' discussion was all in a technical classical Greek into Renaissance story, which would probably infuriate the likes of Martin Bernal, but um, not to mention the Afrocentrists. But certainly in Akan tradition, there seems to be a big use of uh, this oral history, there's a lot of oral history. Um, and there's also the use of objects and images to hang stories and moral points around. Does anyone have a clue what Sankofa is? No? It's an Adinkra symbol, which would originally be printed onto cloth with a calabash stamp. Um, though this is a colorful version of it. Or, in this case, it's been carved into a chief's stool, which is kind of uh, symbol of authority and it unpacks thus uh, it's sewo were fina usankofa ayenchi means there's there's no there's no shame that attaches to going back to fetch something that you forgot and that unpacks further into a variety of different things like you made a mistake, you completely bolted things up, that's all right, you can go back, fix it, and move on again. And a third set of meanings is around remember your history. So they have a way of having a memory object which has a number of associations tied around it, and you only, they only need to allude to that, in a sense, to be able to trigger those thoughts in the shared community of knowledge. Now, I could just ramble all over the place, and in fact, when I start out this sort of thing, I usually start with um, a kind of a mind map, or some people call it a, a spider diagram. Actually, with a guardian touch, maybe I could call it an Anansi diagram, because of course it tricks the spider. So I kind of was plotting out the various things I might talk about, and things that I might just allude to in passing. Um, I also, by the way, been playing with um, a, what's it called? A scaffold. Anyone try a scaffold? It's a sort of, you kind of plop things on a white surface and you draw, drag links between them. Actually, when I compare the affordances of the two things, of course, this is more editable. But I quite like my coloured pens and the ability to do curved lines in the pictures. Um, so, uh, I, I do need to follow some sort of track, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start my track 
uh, with Professor Wendy Hall. Now, Wendy Hall is the head of the Department of Electronics and Computing Science at Southampton University. Uh, she's a former president of the, I was going to say the British Computer Society, which is what I call it. It likes to call itself the Chartered Institute for IT, BCS, the Chartered Institute for IT. Um, I'll probably film with my sticking my tongue out there, you might have to snip that. Um, and she's giving a, uh, the Lovelace Medal to a man I greatly respect, um, and have, in, have, have interviewed, which is, anyone know, anyone recognize the face? John, Post, John Warner, who created, invented PostScript and PDF. Um, great chat. Now, I heard Wendy give a talk around the year 2000, have been able, neither, none of my friends have been able to actually pin down the exact date. I have asked. Um, and uh, she'd become excited about this idea of life logging. Yeah. The idea being that, um, and I, actually if I just flip forward this, I'll remind myself this way. Uh, one of the postgraduate students, or three students actually, wrote an article um, in her department on this subject, talking about the growth of computing capacity as predicted by Moore's law has meant that there are few barriers to the storage of information. In particular, a person can now store significant quantities about him or herself, in other words, if you like, digital memory. Um, and then there are some some stats there, a typical desktop PC will probably be able to hold, you know, the, well, yeah, this, what they're talking. Gordon Bell and Jim Jemmel, I think it's pronounced, these are a couple of pioneers of this idea that you could video your whole life, you could have a video record of all of your life, and it would be no, maybe 100 terabytes of data, but that should be kind of really easy to do in a few years. Whenever I kind of tell people about this idea, quite frankly, they tend to respond in the same way that I did when I heard Wendy speak. I thought, well, that's a bloody daft idea. You need a whole other life to watch the video of your first life. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I, I still think that that's a little bit odd, although I have revised my opinions a little. One of the things that I think is quite interesting in, um, in, in this is she never said whether the cameras in question were going to be pointing out or in. You know, was it, would it be you filming everything out there in your world that you happen to encounter and the people that you talked to? So if you end up with a kind of simulacrum of your head, your head's experience of the world, perhaps now with extra data like the GPS data so that you know where you were at the time when you did that. Or is it supposed to be an images of you? I'm thinking something like, Phil, you know, Philip Pullman uh, and uh, the um, Northern Lights and those other, his Dark Materials books where they have these, these demons that follow them around. I suppose you'd need a private drone that would hover around above your shoulder and film your life for you. But actually, that then got me worried. Because in a way, although it wasn't something I originally wanted to talk about, I want to invite you to a rather nasty thought experiment. Suppose Let's not make it the whole world, though actually if you're into Isaac Asimov or Caves of Steel or that kind of science fiction, I, I prefer, you know, give it a thousand years, you can imagine it how you want, but just to scale it down a bit. Suppose that we have something like a psychiatric institution, so that we have, let us say, um, a building, we've got a number of rooms, they could be dormitories, whatever. Suppose that in that every inmate is obliged to have clamped around their um, their wrist a, some sort of some sort of marker that tells the house where they are. 
this is the kind of scary version of the Big Brother house. Yeah? So, uh, according to that, the cameras know how to follow you, and they know there might be two or three people in the institution, but they know who to track. So you might have multiple points of view, you could have cameras all over the place, so when you appear within that space, you are being filmed. Um, so this is not life logging as you might want to do it, because that's your wish to do it, but I suddenly kind of felt this sort of sickening feeling in my stomach as the whole subject turned upside down, and I thought, we could be life logged, you know, from cradle to grave. Uh, in some sort of horrible science fiction scenario. Um, and then you wonder, well, would people actually be able, you know, I've talked about film your whole life and you need another life to do it. But actually I started thinking, maybe this is not so stupid, really. So for example, if I can just drop out of my slides, I used to teach with great big carousels of 35 millimeter slides in codec carousels. Used to go around the country with four or five carousels of slides in my rucksack. Um, now, just to show you, for example, uh, Station X. <coughs> right, so there's a video which I made for the Yes, women. And it's called Women of Station X. It's about the ladies who uh, did ran the decoding regimes at Bletchley Park. After May 1940, the German assault on Britain began in real earnest. This is the news, and this is John Snag reading it. Um, uh, I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but what I am going to show you is that if I just drag the slider, you can actually get a sense of the structure of the video without the sound, of course, in a matter of a few minutes. So it might well be that you could imagine that in my nightmare scenario, it would be possible for someone to review it, particularly if there was some computer intelligence that decided, oh right, he was in the room, but he was asleep in the chair, so we could just chop that bit of the video out, and then you could sort of focus in on, on being able to concentrate. One of the things that I, want, I should mention is, I often kind of do this sort of skimming about to be able to find um, the bits in a video. Um, QuickTime's very good for that. But um, it's, you can't do it with audio. You can't really skim. It, it's something to do about the, the way that our eyes can process a very rapid sequence of pictures and get a sense of what's going on, but we can't do it with audio. And um, I, my, a friend of mine spoke recently, well, spoke during the summer at a conference where I recorded all of the talks, all 60 talks, and I'm still processing the bloody things. But in his case, once I actually had taken out all the ums and ahs and lost about four minutes and got it really quite nice, I realized you're probably, actually, you're probably, your boss probably doesn't want to hear that you said that about the place that you were. So I sent it off to him and I said, I think you might want to redact this. So he sent me back an email saying, could you take out where I say this? And could you take out this picture? And could you take out that bit here? And I did, but I had to listen to the whole bloody thing again, because he never sent me any time code. You know, that would have been, that would have helped is just to know which of the significant parts. And I'll come back to that idea of time code and what it's about um, when, we, when I talk about next day. Now, returning to the slides. Um, we are there. Okay, so. Slide show. Yes, we are. Okay. The software I'm using, by the way, is Media Pro, Phase 1 Media Pro. Created originally in Britain as iView Media Pro for both Mac and PC. Uh, bought by Microsoft, completely ballsed up and trashed. Rescued by a, a, a Danish company, Phase One, that makes camera bags. And now it's beautiful and it works again. Uh, 
memory. Yes, it is true that memory has been dropping in price and expanding in capacity. This is um, at the, Nash at the Museum, National Museum of Computing, and I believe that the Lisa had a, was it a five, five megabyte hard disk? Certainly by the time I bought my first hard disk in 1985, which was a 20 megabyte, megabyte, megabyte external hard disk for the Mac, it cost 1,350 pounds plus PAT. And, uh, but now we have other kinds of stuff, like, you know, I actually have over there at one and a half, no, two and a half terabytes of disk. This is another terabyte of disk. Um, you can get these up to, what is it, 64, maybe even 128, yeah. yeah. Uh, and this, these sorts of things are what I've got in, uh, well, something that's recording my talk. So going onto an SD card there, SD card in the camera that's always in my pocket. So memory is definitely heading in the direction that the life loggers were predicting. Um, so going on that, that uh, they describe what life logging uh, means, um, but they also notice include as elements of your life, your emails, your documents, your digital photographs and video diaries, calendars, etc. And this was even before um, the National Security Agency and GCHQ burst into the internet. Um, that's partly. Um, oh yeah, I was going to talk about things in a moment. So there was this idea of uh, uh, being able to record vast amounts of stuff, but if you had vast amounts of stuff about yourself and you had some control over it, uh, would it, would it actually help you to make sense of your world, or would it confuse you? Now I'm going to tell you in a very brief summary of the story. Do any, you've not, none of you heard of Funes the Memorial? Yeah, two of you heard. So, hope you'll forgive me if I just uh, go through. It's, as I say, by the Argentinian writer, Jorge Luis Borges. It concerns, a, it's a fictitious thing, of course, about a young gaucho who has an accident, he falls off his horse, and from the point when he does that, he is unable to forget anything. Everything everything uh, accumulates in his head. Um, and despite the fact that he's now um, crippled, he's not worried about that because it seems at least at first to be this wonderful gift of being able to see everything in amazing detail and remember it all. Um, now, the commentator is skeptical about the utility of this. For example, um, he, uh, he had a new system of numbering things, and he'd gone around to 24,000. So, for example, in place of 7,013, he would say Maximo Perez. And for other numbers, they would be Brimstone, or The Whale, etc. In lieu of 500, he would say 9, particularly confusing. Um, and he just couldn't be convinced that place order arithmetic actually had some utility. <laughs> Uh, everything had to be very particular. Um, and also, he had another project, which I'm missing out here, which was an infinite vocabulary, a name for every discrete thing. Not only that, but for every discrete thing at every different sec sec second of its existence. Um, uh, the conclusion of the... Um, yes, he was the solitary and lucid spectator of a multiform word, world which was instantly and almost intolerably exact, and he seemed to be completely unable to generalize. And maybe generalizing is a form of forgetting. In fact, I've read a number of articles recently in the scientific press about the function of sleep, and you know, just getting rid of, rid of some of the guff in your head might be one of the things that, uh, that is burning. I saw this as, I, I always carry the camera, and I, so my form of life logging isn't partly my life, it's also partly things that I see that amuse me, and which I then sometimes share on Facebook. Um, and uh, I quite like this video production company, it's called Be Real. And 
I thought, hmm, I wonder what is the relationship between being real and being, uh, how should we say it, mediated, perhaps, by uh, digital media. Um, <clears throat> just to talk a little bit about the kinds of things I encounter in professional practice, I don't really just do this as a hobby. I try to make uh, money with it as well. I've got a variety of different uh, microphones. Uh, you can use different microphones for different things. My my one-to-one -one interview kit is in this box here, and uh, uh, this little black nipple here is actually my Rhoda pin mic, which um, is also a great use in a little, quite fun project I'm doing with my mate Danny called Walkie Talk. But this, for example, is the kind of setup that I might deploy if I'm recording a conference uh, or a meeting. Actually, I can record up to, I can put up to four uh, audio sources uh, into, uh, into the mixer desk, which is only about 120 quid. This isn't too expensive to do. And then the workhorse, really, that I'm using at the moment is the Morant PMD661, which is a digital audio recorder. And um, one of the things that's given me pause for thought is, as I mentioned, I was for the International Society for Knowledge Organization, UK chapter, I've actually recorded every lecture at every meeting and conference for about the last five years. That's not lifelong, because it, it just gets switched off in between times. But you know, there are significant chunks of stuff. And ISCO has made a policy um, not to put this behind a paywall, but if you search ISCO UK, you can download any of those MP3s, and we've now got something in the region of 120 lectures there with the PowerPoint slides or, P or, or the uh, PDFs slides, and we've got the audio as well. Um, so this is now kind of organizational memory that we're talking about. Um, and one of the things that we realized uh, about a year ago was, you know, it's like cobblers, the story of the cobbler's children that don't have any shoes. We're a knowledge organization, organization, and our knowledge is not at all organized, and people can't find the stuff. So we're actually, at, at the moment, embarking on a process, and that might be worthy of discussion when we get around to discussion, of how on earth do we add metadata to these resources, how, who is going to write summaries, will we, how will we, what sort of classification scheme can we apply to them, what sort of keywords, will we use a controlled vocabulary or a folksonomy, how will we let people find their way amongst this pile of stuff. Uh, so that is one real case study, uh, this the ESCO website as it is at the moment, um, and yet to start editing those particular talks. But I have been doing the ones from the uh, summer conference, and here you can see that Rebecca Green, I've chosen this particular talk because it was about the classification of digital content, uh, she's from OCLC in the States, um, Dublin, Ohio. Uh, and we've got a PDF of her slides. She contributed a paper as well. And the MP3 is ready to download. And actually, thank God, she was a very clear speaker. And it was very easy to edit. I tell you, sometimes this, well, one couple of speakers who shall remain nameless, I was able to... Cut, from the 37-minute talk, I was able to cut nine minutes with no loss of content due to the amount of repetition, um, uh, etc. I make them look good. That's one of the things I do. What do I have to pay you to name them, comrade? Um, I think you'd have to probably buy me a couple of drinks. <laughs> Uh, the other, just yesterday, um, I met Rory and Neelam. I haven't seen them for 35 years. We got back in touch through uh, Facebook. So Neelam is taking a picture of me and her husband. And one of the things
things that's quite funny. I'm leading on now to the fact that actually, once you start putting stuff on social media, um, maybe you don't own the image. And I think a lot of people who take images and self, you know, selfies and things like that, and they stick them up on, on Facebook, they don't really have a concept of actually owning them. And in fact, once they go into that space and people start to make comments, then maybe they do, in a sense, become a kind of public property. But you maybe want to care be careful of that, what you reveal for yourself on Facebook. Um, uh, and Rory actually teased on this, because when we were about to meet up the day before, he said, by the way, I, he says, I'm not going to bash you with a beer can uh, this time. And he put in brackets, that will get them wondering why. <laughs> so I followed up with a comment and I said, well, Rory, she wasn't really worth it anyway. And that will really get them thinking. And no, I'm not going to tell that story. But it kind of gives you an idea of how actually you would probably want to redact the digital memories that you share, but nevertheless you might still want to have a reserve. You know, when uh, Adrian said, oh, can we film you? I thought, well, that's one picture at least that I'm not going to include in the show. Um, and about a year ago, um, some of my friends in knowledge management said, Conrad, you've always got such a lot of stories to tell and facts and stuff like that. Actually, if I could just drop in something there, I have a young friend, the sea chair, and her since she was seven. And at that when she was about 10 or 11, she came up with the wonderful malapropism. She said, Conrad, you're a minefield of information. I think she meant a mine of information, but a minefield can be more surprising. Um, so, uh, anyway, his friend said, when are we going to read your autobiography? And I said, I've got people's secrets to keep. I'm not going to do an autobiography. But I, what I will do is I'm going to talk about aspects of technology and aspects of personal history um, that I feel I can share, uh, and I'm going to do them as podcasts. So I've done that. They're on my website radiator.com slash av and um, they are uh, it's quite fun to do but I'm scripting these by and large I'm scripting these and I'm being very careful about uh, what I do say just to give you a little quick sample of that um, so if I again I'm just um, okay. here's one I prepared over here Sometimes I'm actually able to make it into a little kind of radio production. I mean, one of the things I really enjoyed about being in Studio 53 at uh, um, the broadcasting house is that I'm, secretly I want to be a radio production. It's comrade doing it in autobiographic mode, it's a request of friends. And this chapter could be called How I Got Involved with Southeast Asia. But first, here's Freddie Aguilar singing the Filipino patriotic song by Hank Cole. to be living with political refugee Tanwa Piao and Chu Bing Lan, and lovely house guests they were too. Some of my work for Luz was to do with preparing publications for print. This became a big focus after Indonesia invaded East Timor in December 1975. In 1976, with the assistance of the Journal of Contemporary Asia Folks, an international conference was held in Bonn, which I attended. And I stayed on in Freiburg for a week afterwards with the German Osttimor Solidaritätskomitee, which was part made up of radical Indonesian students. So that's the kind of stuff that I'm doing, although most of the other ones that I've done subsequently have been about adventures with 
print and publishing technology, starting with stencil duplicators, if anyone remembers stencil duplicators, and going on to doing paste up for a magazine and then uh, specifying typesetting, and eventually the last one I did was about how I met Western Publishing and the Macintosh. So that, that's quite a fun little project, but it's quite a controlled little project. But it's interesting because in order to write one of these things, I'm forced to research my own past and look through my own mementos and things like that. So it's quite an interesting relationship between media and, um, uh, and, and memory. And of course, it's a, all of these things are in a sense interpreted. So that's the that's how it looks on the website. Um, that's the that's the web address, just forward slash AV. And I'm, I've put them on Podomatic, uh, so you, and I, then I embed the player in the page, so you can listen to it, you can stream it, um, or alternatively, if you want to nick the MP3, well, my intellectual has not very many properties, and you can you can do that. Gazetta. Um, also, I've tried doing things that are a little bit more spontaneous, and they're quite fun too. So, um, in uh, Enfield River Village, along the Lee Navigation, um, there's a, a new housing estate there, and in the, it's on the site of the Royal Small Arms Factory, um, the last product of which was the SA80, but also where the Enfield 303 brain gun and stem gun were produced. Um, and actually, I just found myself last week writing in my history of Ghana about uh, this particular weapon, which is the Martini Henry, which is the first um, breech-loading uh, rifle in the world. And again, just to um, go dive into the middle of this. So basically, I, I went in there, I wrote some notes, I took some photographs, I went and sat next to the ducks outside, had me sandwiches, picked up the... Uh, the end of the MCE 58, which was attached to this, and just went for it. Edited it on the bus going home, and uh, stuck it up. Um, Two guns that were in the collection interested me. The Snyder rifle was a stopgap project to convert a whole load of Pattern 53 muzzle loaders to breech loading, taking a brass cartridge, a cartridge wrapped around the brass foil. And I've heard that Snyders were implicated in the British wars in the Gold Coast against the redoubtable Ashanti nation, centred in Kumasi. Now, the Ashanti had been buying guns for years. They knew how to use them. Their army was quite well equipped. And uh, firing from deep forest cover into the British lines of scarlet jackets, the Brits were at a considerable disadvantage. Uh, when both sides had muzzle loaders, this was certainly the case, and I think you can think of it a bit like the scene in the film The Last of the Mohicans, when the Huron unsportingly fire out of forest cover onto the British lines, wreaking a great slaughter. And then, of course, they go on to say, you know, once the Brits had weapons that they could fire eight times as frequently as the Ashanti, the tables were turned. So that was really kind of a spontaneous reaction to what I saw. Well, not quite spontaneous, because I wasn't doing it there and then. I was, in fact, um, uh, um, you know, I kind of digested it first in a notebook and then, and then regurgitated it. Um, now, I think I'm just going to skip a little bit here, so choosing that as my start point. This is a bit of field recording. I've got, actually, I haven't resized this image properly, but my, this, this is on the top of the pole with a great furry thing, like a you know, like round it up a gerbil, uh, guinea pig bottom. Um, and uh, I'm recording a, the Markfield steam engine, and that was quite nice as well. I can't play the clip on this, I really want to hear it, but there, there's lots of beautiful gurgling noises and steam noises and things like that from this machine, which only gets, to, only gets fueled up and run about three or four times. Um, but actually, you know, if I'm to think about usability, and I do think about usability because I am amongst other things an intro 
information designer with an interest in in inter interface design. Uh, an audio recording has significant disadvantages over actually writing something up. Uh, Google can't index intelligently anything that's just sound, nor can it index the content of video. And so sometimes doing a recording is just a precursor to something else. So for example, the foundation meeting of the network that I manage, KIDA, uh, we had a day's uh, uh, discussion, and this is a not quite, it's not verbatim, it's reported speech, but it's very close and in very great detail about everything that was said, and it comes to about 40 pages. Here's another thing, which was a lecture by Professor Ian Horrocks on ontologies in the semantic web, um, uh, one of the Needham lectures of the British Computer Society, which they recorded and which I was then horrified to hear they were going to do nothing with. So in, I collaborated with Ian Horrocks, including, by the way, you know, people are interested about these things, including redrawing the cartoons that he'd stolen, and he, we would get into big trouble if we put, you know, stolen cartoons on the web. So I just took the, the same jokes, if you like, and we drew them. Um, but that was a report that I did for that. So these are what I call a reported speech transcript. Um, and actually, I was able to add to that because things that he merely skipped over and didn't explain terribly well, I was able to research and put into footnotes. I was able to give references, and I drew a few diagrams. Uh, this was never, ne this one never saw <clears throat> the light of day. It was a report of a day's meeting on um, social media and healthcare. And the only thing to notice here is that, again, it's a fairly full account of the discussion, which was for the purpose of policy making afterwards. But notice that I embed time code uh, through the thing uh, in order to uh, uh, help people to use it out. Um, I've got bloody cold, I think I tell you. Uh, helping my friend to uh, coppice his woodland in, in Devon. It was a good opportunity to test his bill hook, his English bill hook, against my Martindale number no. two Golob, which is the SAS bush knife. Um, <coughs> they're both as good as each other. Um, but I was just going to stick that up there and just share a few thoughts about metadata. <clears throat> when we're managing information, particularly those of you who are from the kind of libraries and information science side, uh, will know that metadata and classification are very powerful kinds of tools that, um, that we've come to uh, rely on. Uh, and we're in a unique situation, I think, when it comes to media. We're actually in quite a good situation when it comes when uh, it comes to photography. So the program, this game for ten years. Um, the program that I've been using here to demonstrate these images to you. Uh, if I go to my catalogs file, which is called catalogs, um, and the when I carry the ca camera around. <coughs> I'll store, store them in this folder called this uh, archive called Loose Canon. Whether it's um, the canon that's loose or me, it's not the matter. But if I, let's say, I, I'm actually not very good at practicing what I preach, I, I, I do put much metadata on at all. But you'll see that increasingly, of course, we have a form of mechanized me metadata because of the, di the born digital nature of photography. You know about EXIF? Yes, some do. So uh, EXIF is a Japanese industrial standard originally, and it's a way of embedding uh, data in the file about the file. And so uh, that can be read into this program so we can see what kind of encoding it is. And I'll say something about raw file, format file, dimensions, the bit depth of the of the uh, images, creation date, um, what kind of device it was, 
what the shutter speed was, things like that. They're all there. Um, of course, there were some cameras like Lumix. Um, some of the Lumix cameras have got um, GPS. So you'll also get a location stored in the metadata. But the other thing is that if, you, if I were diligent, I'm not, um, I would be able also to do such things as, uh, um, for instance, if there were people in the scene, I could say, I think it's over, over here for, um, I can't see it. There's something here for people, and I can say that's all you. Yeah? Right at the bottom. Right at the bottom. Okay, so I can double click and I can say that's all of you. And then that means that the database becomes searchable. And of course, image libraries live and die by this sort of this sort of thing. Um, there's you can also add IPTC um, subject codes, and that is uh, an internationally standardized set of codes for the subjects of photographs that's used by the news industry. Um, and the codes mediate between, they have lots of different language labels, so you can go in in Spanish and say, I want this, and it will bring up the appropriate thing. So that's just a wee bit about metadata. Compared to that, um, I go back to the slides and I skip around them a bit. Um, this is the in our time radio broadcast. You know, Adrian, they do that in the same in the same studio you were in, Studio Fifty Three. Uh, and so you can see things like the, they they actually able to write quite a long date, which I can see if I get the information out of QuickTime. But at the moment, I've only got the ability to add metadata using iTunes. I can't really afford anything more sophisticated. And for things like the ISCO talks, it's stupid. You have to say that the, the, um, that the person who spoke was the singer and that the composer was ISCO UK. And I suppose I could put more notes in the lyrics field if I wanted, but you know, you're really kind of trying to twist um, a limited uh, metadata setup, which is called ID3, is the metadata format for. skip a few things there and just talk about two projects and then I'll sum up uh, and we can, uh, we can discuss. So this is an image of my, this is my one-to-one -one recording kit, which I finally got together at the beginning of, of this year. Um, and uh, I have, one of the things I have in mind is I want to interview people who've had lifelong experiences primarily retired people who've seen development of computing, information science, knowledge organization, and this sort of thing. And uh, in particular, I've, I've started a focus. I haven't yet edited the first recording, but I had a fantastic interview with this guy. Oh, I haven't said that in the name of all of them. Lou Bernard, that is his nose. Um, he looks a little bit like Bill Ollie. Uh, and he it has been behind the development of semantic markup of text using SGML and XML, a project called the Text Encoding Initiative. And this is the sort of hidden histories of computing and information processing that I'm hoping to develop all the histories of um, uh, in, in, the years, in the years to come. Uh, regarding that, Regarding oral history, when Rory and Neelam and I went to the Coram Foundling Hospital, we found these benches that have got these funny things. They look a little bit like rugby balls, but actually you can lean against them and very quietly coming out of there is an oral history. So these are elderly people who were in fact foundlings, orphans, uh, who were, uh, so for example, Harold Tennant admitted to the London Foundling Hospital 27 February 1912, this is his story. This is fantastic kind of stuff, I love this kind of stuff. This is my mate Danny, and Danny and I have a particular project that I'll tell you about and then I'll stop. 
Um, and we call it walkie talk. And in fact, we've got a uh, um, we've got a, I've got a page up on the website which is starting to relate to walkie talk. But what you'll see is he's reading the London North um, bit of um, Pevsner, which is the guide to architecture in England. And he knows quite a lot of particularly 18th and 19th century history and later history. Uh, we've been exploring around the docks, which is what he did his, uh, his master's thesis on. I tend to know more about medieval history. We're both interested in architecture. Um, we're both a bit sort of comedian. And, uh, and so what, we, what we've done, uh, what I've devised is, I wear the rig that you can see me wearing now, but with extra bits on. So I've got the Morantz recorder. Yep. The Morantz recorder is running at the moment on mono. This is the Rhoda pen mic, which when it goes outside has a dead mount, sorry, a fluffy thing around it to protect against the wind. I will then have another cable coming out to a UHF radio receiver that I wear on my belt. And I get Danny to wear a UHF transmitter with another lapel mic. And it, you get quite a good representation of what we're talking about. And we just, just carry on you know, normal conversation. Um, or what passed for normal when uh, Conrad and Danny are involved anyway. What passes for normal. And um, uh, so far, we've managed to, um, well, I mean, this is one, we, we, we walked, and the, the battery's held up for about four and a half hours. Uh, we've got about four and a half hours worth of rubbish, edited it down, and um, well, it amuses us. And I'll just give you a couple of seconds of that. Thomas Paine wrote The Rights of Man. Okay. He stayed in Walter Street, which is one of the roads up here, while he wrote it. Just off Marenburg High Street, we find a sheltered and sunny garden with rest for sandwiches and more chat, followed by a visit to the Conrad shop to look at stuff we neither need nor would want to spend money on, even if we could. This is the garden, or we can go to the park, the park just around the corner. So that's just, that's just quite a fun little project. It's a sort of life login, but then we kind of edit it. We're playing and being radio. So what I've done is to take you through some of my experiments in modified life logging in a different number of different media types. Some of my skepticisms about whether life logging is a viable or sensible thing to do. Some scary ideas about what life logging might be if other people did it to us on a mass scale. Um, and some things about the problems of managing this kind of You don't have to rush off. If you don't need to rush off to the uh, open house, please uh, now join for questions and discussion. Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, this reminds me of. Uh, did you see the channel for Black Mirror? Do you, do you know what? Here's another strange thing about me. I never watch TV. I'm a radio kid. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a TV. Uh, Tell us. No, tell us. So, so Black Mirror is a uh, uh, kind of views of society as it is at the moment, but with a kind of side twist. So then some of them are sort of slightly in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's one of the episodes which is about my problem. Okay. Essentially, that uh, everyone has these content editors and they, and they log everything they see all the time. And this kind of story ever told that this woman's had an affair and the other guy gets her to kind of review her life blog and find the affair. And, uh, <laughs> Have you read any of William Gibson's sprawl novels? Uh, Neuromancer, Count Zero, that sort of thing. 
and particularly in Camp Zero, uh, they have this. They, they have these. Uh, uh, programs in which you can choose the point of view of any either of the actors, and the actors have had their eyes replaced with implants from Nikon. Um, and there's a terrorist attack on one of the sets, and uh, uh, a tech comes from the film company to extract the eyes because they're worth two million each, and she's not going to go to her grave with those in. Yes. Thank you for me. That's something on the uh, platform. Yeah. Uh, I've been keen on this idea for about like half a year, and I've been logging some of the uh, bits of my life. Like, for instance, I have this bracelet uh, on like, this time, I don't know how to call it. Okay. It the physical activity, so like, it counts the number of steps that you've done. Oh, I think I've heard of this. What's it called? Uh, I think it's Spice Bit. Okay. is that without some degree of automation for these things, it, to be semantically useful, uh, the classification and the logging of the logging could actually be quite time consuming. And it reminds me of a cartoon uh, it, around the beginning of the period of desktop publishing, should we say, around late 80s, where the, this uh, one worker is saying to her co-worker, Recently, I started making a newsletter about my daily activities, but now I find that my time is taken up totally with making the newsletter. So you, you're sort of not living you, as, as the uh, as the glass window said. You've got to be real. Um, is it? Could you not run it through a uh, filter screen and see what you get on Twitter? That's actually I had thought about mentioning this. I. 
I have seen a very interesting application. I was filming an, an, a part of a network called Handy, the Health Apps Network for Development and Innovation. And I was filming a, a, a workshop of this in Bradford, and one of the people presenting in small table groups, they have an app called Reflect, and it's about the fact that many medical personnel have got no time to record and share with their colleagues about the meeting that they've gone to. They mostly say the only free time we've got is when we're in the car, driving from one place to the other, and our hands are full. So they devised an app which has a structured template of questions. It asks you a question, like, uh, it's called Kevin, or something, so uh, Kevin will ask you, um, what was the meeting about? And then that prompts you to say, uh, it was about quality of outcomes framework points, or something like that. And uh, what were the main points that you learned? And then you say something like that. That goes, that goes onto a, an Android device or an iOS device. It then goes up to the cloud where they can invoke some rather heavier processing power and it sends you back text. They've got about a 95% accuracy rate at the moment, which means that at least they can squirt a reasonably legible summary to other people around the practice. I think we'll see more of this because both Google and Apple are trying to boost the uh, speech to text capability of their platform. There's been a lot of that going on in real time translation as well. Um, well a babel fish in the ear. Yeah, but I saw it, uh, there's a new scientist article about it last week um, mm. talking about someone who's who done a lot of translation in English that was translated by Japanese by Google Translator mm. and they did a pretty good job of it. So if that's possible, it must be possible to do the, the transcription. I would love to have the budget to give some of that a go. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah, I'm sure it would be available. Yeah, just, just as Google will translate the web pages for free, it will mm. do the same with the transcription. Some of the translation are not very good. Google's translation, if you type a single sentence, you will find the way it's translated into other language, and the language is not fitting for the purpose. Yeah, I think sometimes, depending upon the language groups as well, I think some directions are more reliable than other ones. So if you're using it as a way to give yourself some search for text, which yeah. you can then use to find out where something is in your, in your talk, um, so you can, you know, One of the things, by the way, I want to thank Google for is the way is now quite forgiving if you can't spell things properly. <laughs> and it's not because I got bad spelling, but I got it given a job of, um, there were 14 endovascular surgeons who were asked to do, they were doing a focus group on what would be the ideal operating theater. What would they have in, in that? My job was initially to record it. Then they thought, oh my God, we've got to get this into text. Let's ask Conrad if he'll do it. But of course, they're inventing all of this terminology all the time. I didn't know how to spell half of these things. So it was quite nice to be able to just throw in a search term in Google and get the correct spelling back. <laughs> it made me look clever in the transcript. Okay. So is there any comment or question? I'm putting her on the spot. She's a student. <laughs> I have a simple question. Do you think this technology can improve? Don't be shy. Anything is fine. That's a very good question, and I'm thinking more and more about that. Um, in fact, uh, one of the points that my mate D Danny Budzak made at the last ISCO meeting was that, um, and I've written, I've written about this within the Kidham group, He's pre uh, he works for the London uh, Olympics Legacy Organization, and they are basically archiving all the as built diagrams, and all sorts of stuff relating to the whole site. And one of the things they're finding is they are getting this information, but it's difficult to make sense of it because they don't have access to the knowledge of the context that the information came out of. And they've been, so we've started to discuss the fact that there may be a need not only for an information audit to gather this sort of information, but also some form of knowledge audit in order to, and, and this also is coming up in these hard pressed times when organizations are having to um, 
slim down their staff and often they're losing quite experienced staff or they're going to another organization, people are walking out the door with knowledge in their head. And it might be, um, in fact, a, a bunch of friends of mine who are beginning to think hard about what sort of space there is around consultancy and gathering narratives and micro-narratives that could be of use in corporate knowledge. I think it is a very, I don't have all the answers, but I think it's hugely promising. In multinational corporations, they're trying to uh, preserve or reserve the knowledge in different ways, and the experimentations are still going on. There is no definitive solution or no uh, very good solution yet. There's a very interesting exercise that a mate of mine, uh, Ron Donaldson, ran recently, and uh, he very kindly allowed, actually, he wanted me to photograph him. He doesn't have enough photographs of him for the website. So I sat in on the workshop, and it was for the London Fire Brigade and other fire brigades. Um, and there's a particular exercise that Ron runs. It's out of Australia. It's called Future Backwards, where you say, this is our situation here. This is how we got here. We imagine a sort of a heaven of where we'd like to be and a hell of how it could really fall to the bar. And these explaining backwards again is where those came from. And in the first half of the thing, when you're going from the present backwards, suddenly one guy gave us the entire history of fire service policy going back to 1910. I mean, he's not from 1910, but he knows all of that history. Nobody else in the room knew that. I happened to have the recorder on, and we captured it. So within that context of that exercise, it provided the trigger whereby we, we learned a huge amount about what had happened in terms of the management of the fire service. You know, and originally it was a national, serv a, a national service built up. It was then fragmented into regional services. Knowledge is beginning to get lost. In knowledge management within the fire service is imperiled. Nobody knows how to put out the fire on board a ship anymore, for example. So that, that just to hear that and to capture that was fantastic. And the lady that was kind of in charge of it said, can we have that recording? I said, sure, I'll squirt you the MP3 across tomorrow. The thing is that when you're capturing that type of situation, you are storing it. How you are going to use the same type of video or audio for the next situation is difficult. Because you will not find the same situation next time. And you might get some knowledge out of your previous experience, but how you are going to encode it and reuse it is a chaotic problem. Yeah, I think that starts to take us in different directions. Do you know the book, The Social Life of Information? Um, I can't immediately remember the authors. Do you know about the ethnographic study that was done in Xerox with the photo, with the laser John, printing? John Seely Brown, one of the authors. John Seely Brown, that's yeah. right, is the, one of the authors of the, of the first book. But he quotes the, uh, the Xerox case mm -hmm. as well. Um, and the, the Eureka, I think it's called the Eureka Project, did manage to, for instance, one time, they managed to stop the need to ship a quarter million dollar dock color 40 to Brazil because somebody in Canada knew that the reason it kept failing was a bit of rust that was on the ends of the fuses. So if you got a bit of sandpaper and cleaned it every now and again. So there, there are some interesting stories around, but I think it takes us in a different direction. But audio might be a form of capturing that. As it happens, they built a database and they encouraged the but it had started, Julian Orr, that's the name of the, the anthropologist, and he discovered that what they did was that they had breakfast to get these engineers, they're kind of, they, they're like gunslingers of the trade, you know, they've, they've got their bag of tools, they walk in there, they solve the problem, but they meet problems, you know, these are complex machines and they don't behave like it says in the manual. So they would meet for breakfast, they'd meet for lunch, they'd meet for drinks after, uh, after work, and they would swap stories and exchange knowledge. And sh they also built up a reserve of tools. But on the basis of that, some companies would say, in fact, I've heard of stories, I think it was Thames Water, where they tried to stop engineers talking to each other. <laughs>
but and with disastrous consequences. But in the case of Xerox, they have the sense to realize. I mean, Xerox doesn't often have sense, but with that occasion, they have the sense to realize that they should encourage that behavior. Mm. And maybe some of these media, some of these digital memories, uh, might might have a role to play. Yeah, yeah. Do sometimes this digital media will help us, but there needs to be uh, your metadata, meta listening needs to be embedded in that. Yes, I think that that That's the main is, issue. and well, yes, and I think one of the areas is there are some of us who know that, and there are people that run those companies that don't really realize that and therefore the companies are suffering because the value of that is not appreciated. Big, it's a big issue at the moment in the NHS. Unfortunately, I know, I've got two friends, Dave Snowden of College of Edge as well, Ron Donaldson is another, um, who are actually being engaged by the difficulties of the NHS to actually tackle that, so there is hope. In the multinational corporation of the European law to preserve them if you know any who would like to spend some money on me, oh, I would have to. <laughs> I could do some work. Yeah. And uh, do you think that audio recording with, uh, would make a much impact than a video? Like, um, do you know the term affordances? Like as Donald Norman talks about affordances, the mm -hmm. cognitive psychologist who's very much into usability topics. He illustrated like this, when he worked for the um, um, Applied Psychology Unit of the Medical Research Council in Cambridge, he, he had to use um, a rural station where they, had, they didn't have a ticket office, they had a glass shelter. What happened was that kids kept breaking the glass shelter. So then they took out the glass and they put plywood up instead and they got spray painted. Because one of the affordances of plywood is it's quite good to spray paint on and on the affordances of glass is that it breaks. So if you think about the affordances of video versus audio, you know, I'm often approached by people who say, we're having a meeting, sorry, I should be standing. Yeah. Hi. Um, we're having a meeting, can you set up video cameras and stuff, can we video the meeting? And I say, do you really think some of them BCS meetings, and they're not the most exciting in the world. Do you really think that somebody is going to want to watch a not particularly attractive older gentleman standing in front of some boring PowerPoint slides? And, um, and the, so I think the other thing with video is even if you don't want to watch it, you end up watching it. Mm. Whereas um, with you know, I have a huge collection of the downloaded podcasts from in that time. And I listen to some of those again and again and again. I might be doing something else, I might be drawing, I might be cooking, I might, you know. Other people listen to these things when they're driving. Um, so video kind of maybe doesn't give you as much of the topic as you really want. And, it, and the other thing is from the production point of view. You remember I mentioned the friend who inadvertently said some things about his company that we had to redact. Very difficult to do that in video because you get a jump cut. If you take out a bit of video, it's obvious something has happened. With audio, no one need ever know it was there in the first place. Okay. Well, I have maybe I have a final question. Mm -hmm. Uh, related to your topic, yeah. and you mentioned a little bit, is uh, we live now in, in the age of in infinite information, and your work is kind of contributing to the overload. How, do you have any advice? How I think we haven't learned how to cope with infinite information because time is finite. So, how yes. do you have advice for us? One way to deal with infinite information is to ignore a hell of a lot of it. Funes the Memorius didn't realize that's what he was supposed to do. And so um, I, it may then be a question of being guided or advised about what's worth paying attention to. It'd be different for different people. Mm. Um, so uh, 
And, and the other thing is that I think if you're an information producer, you have a responsibility to make your information usable. So edit the bloody stuff. Uh, if you're going to if you're going to stick it out there, write a summary that actually says what it's about. You know, if it's an audio or video file, you might want to say there's something really interesting said around minute 53 of this thing. Um, and uh, and I think we need kind of layers of commentary. I think layers of commentary possibly help it. So you said we, we almost need advisors to advisors to filter our stronger data. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it, it's a question, I mean, I think we're kind of on the edge here between, I mean, we've, we've I've been deliberately broad here, I've been talking partly about the completely, you know, kind of egotistical, this is me kind of life logging and presentation stuff, and some stuff, the way we've touched on knowledge organisation in corporates and uh, in learning organisations. Um, so I, I don't think you can lay down one law mm -hmm. for everything. But um, if you do produce information that is verbose, tedious, not particularly interesting, then don't be very surprised if people switch off. <laughs> well, Those guys at BBC Click know how to run a show, <laughs> don't they? Yeah, editing is important. Yeah. Yeah. But I think people don't know how to edit their own input, because there, there is actually so much good data out there. Yeah, yeah. I, think, yeah, yeah. I think one needs a measure of uh, um, uh, uh, self-awareness. I'll end off for you by, by replaying my Ghana theme, and this is a story about Anansi. Anansi is the, is the son of Onyame, the high god, and Ya. Yeah, um, Esare, his wife, um, and he wanted to gather up all of the knowledge in the world. So he went around the forest, collecting up the knowledge and putting it in a big pot, or calabash, and then he thought, it's still not quite safe, I'd better hide it somewhere. So I'm going to take it up a tree. But he couldn't kind of hold the pot and climb the tree at the same time. So he thought, well, I'll tie it onto my stomach, and they found it really difficult to get reach around it to climb up the tree. And his son, who kind of followed along behind secretly, then burst out laughing and said, Dad, why don't you tie it on your back, not your front? And he was so kind of annoyed, firstly, that his son had come up with a cleverer idea than he had, and, 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 and also the frustration of trying to get up the tree, that he dropped it, it broke, just then a storm came. Wisdom flowed out into the rivers and down into the sea, and now we all have a little bit of it. <laughs> okay. Well, it's very good, Max Han. Um, so thank you for coming, and and also on behalf of the people who had to leave because it's mm -hmm. open day, I'm sure, I'm sure that on behalf of everyone we know, it, uh, today's talk was really excellent, and from both the theoretical and practical point of view, we learned a lot. So let's thank uh, Connor for coming to our university today. I'm told, I'm told that having been shot, I'm now going to be sprayed across YouTube. Yes. <laughs> um, I've also got a recording. Thank you, Thank you.